Good day, my friends. I am Vincenzo di Bartolomeo da Brescia, and I am teaching this class on medieval attractions of Italy. Mundanely, I am known as Vince Conaway. I am a subject of Eldermir, although I am currently sheltering in the Kingdom of the Middle. And I want to bid you all welcome to my class and to Penzic 2020, uh, the unnumbered Penzic that wasn't. I uh, am very pleased to be teaching here. I am very happy that this has been arranged, that this is happening, uh, that people have gotten together to make this a thing, that uh, Penzik University will go on with online courses being audited, just as many of the mundane universities have done so um, elsewhere. So I have as an attachment a handout to this. So it, this will be easier to follow with if you have the handout. Also, the handout uh, has certain features on it that I'm going to talk about right now that are uh, the organization of the handout is it starts off discussing things regionally. It goes then by city and then the, lo the, the lowercase um, characters, uh, lowercase letters. <laughs> Are, uh, I came up with characters before letters. That's interesting. The lowercase letters are all attractions individually within the cities. I won't generally be talking about those, but I can't afford to print up a full booklet to make this handout what I would like it to be. So the lowercase letters are all attractions within the cities that if you want to spend a fun afternoon, do some Google image searching, look up these places, find them, take a virtual tour, and I assure you, you will not be disappointed. So, let's jump right in. So medieval Italy is not something most people think about when they think about Italian tourism, and there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, most of which are actually deliberate policies at various points in the past. Much of Europe has a grand medieval tradition. However, Italy is one of the only countries in the world that has a really phenomenal Renaissance tradition and is one of very few countries that has an extraordinarily rich classical tradition. So over the course of centuries, Italian tourism bureaus have decided to market heavily towards classical and Renaissance attractions, um, culminating with Benito Mussolini, uh, who as dictator had a bit of sway over <laughs> certain all policies. And uh, Mussolini hated the Middle Ages. Mussolini believed very strongly in the ancient Roman heritage of the vitality of the Italian people, as well as the culture of the Renaissance. For some value of Renaissance, which I would love to discuss with various folks in person because there really is no such thing. But anyway, for what we think about as a uh, late SCA period, 1400 to 1700, uh, culture was really a high point in Italy for a certain point of view. However, in the Middle Ages, Italy was a thriving place. Italy has a huge cultural heritage from the Middle Ages, especially since Italy was rich in the Middle Ages. Italy had a lot of money in the Middle Ages, and it was money that was very broadly spread out. The thing about the Renaissance, um, is that it is a, a symptom of wealth inequality, where we have these incredible masterworks that survive, but there are fairly few of them because it's a supply and demand. With this massive wealth inequality between the richest people and the normal people, the artists who could perform to a standard that the wealthiest people believed in uh, got all the jobs, and anyone who couldn't reach that standard got nothing. However, in the Middle Ages, wealth was widespread. Communities had a lot of money uh, by comparison. And so art was of a different quality. I hesitate to say lesser, but it was to a less demanding standard. But it was everywhere. And so medieval art is much more widespread. Whereas in the Renaissance, you would have a few dazzling palaces filled with amazing artworks. You would, in the Middle Ages, have entire cities that were swimming in art. And a lot of that art is incredible and very moving and very powerful and fairly widespread. 
and because in Italy, in the Middle Ages, there was a lot of money going around. There is a lot of this medieval art to look at. So for example, Italy, I keep saying, was very wealthy in the Middle Ages, and there were a number of sources of that wealth. Uh, some of them were very local. The reason that Florence became the powerhouse that it became was because they had the best wool in Europe, and so it was based on the wool trade. Venice, which later became a massive trading empire, started out because they had uh, low-lying coastal lands that bordered the sea, which was ideal for uh, the harvesting of sea salt. And so Venice built an empire on salt, and Florence, Venice built a trading empire on salt. Florence built a banking empire on wool. And so the later period industries that we see in these places come from very humble beginnings. But we also have this massive medieval event called the Crusades. And what happened with many crusaders is they would walk as far as they could and then take a boat to the Holy Land. And the farthest that they could walk before having to take a boat would often be Italy, would almost always be Italy. And so Italian ports made a huge amount of money ferrying crusaders to and from the Holy Land. So you have a whole bunch of essentially fishing villages where everyone with a boat hired that boat out to crusaders, ferried them back and forth, back and forth across the uh, Mediterranean, and then invested all of this money in the community. And then when the crusaders were over, they went back to being fishing villages, except now it's a fishing village with this amazing cathedral on the seaside. And so you have these various sources of wealth. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of communities took the early sources of wealth and then built bigger sources from that. Florence took a foundation in the wool trade, became a banking empire, made a massive amount of money in the high middle ages, financing both sides of the Hundred Years' War. For example, Venice, massive trading empire, because they were the entry point of uh, almost all trading goods from the, uh, from the Middle East and from the Far East. And because of that, Venice became extraordinarily rich trading luxuries. And the nice thing about luxuries is they tended to be small, which means you could fit them fairly conveniently on a small boat, which is very convenient when the boats aren't very big. And Venice dominated the Eastern trade, uh, almost monopolized it, until the Portuguese found a long way to, uh, to the East via the sea going around Africa. But that's still a number of years in the future. So as I said earlier, there is this tourism bureau concentration on classical Rome and Renaissance Italy. However, there is currently a Renaissance, if you will, in the medieval culture of Italy. And the reason for this is because Italian school children have Rome and Renaissance driven into them educationally. And so by the time they reach adulthood, they're bored of it. However, they have not had the same exposure to Italy's medieval heritage. And a lot of medievals, a lot of Italy's medieval sites are now open to tourists because they are marketing to local Italians. So you're not necessarily going to see these in transatlantic advertising campaigns because the money is still in Rome and Renaissance when it comes to Americans or even Brits. However, local Italians, as I said, are sick of that. And so the local medieval tower on the corner can open for a three euro admission fee for two, three days a week, having a part-time uh, caretaker, and manage to function with the help of a lot of state grant money, of course, because the arts are, and uh, cultural humanities are always struggling. But because of this local demand for medieval traffic, you do see a lot of tourism sites open to the public that otherwise probably would not be. There are some unique benefits to looking at medieval sites in Europe. I mentioned earlier that Italy has de-emphasized its medieval heritage because it is the best place in the world to find the classical Roman in many cases, classical Greek. There are more surviving classical Greek temples in Sicily than there are in Greece, for example. And, uh, and Renaissance 
culture more than elsewhere in Europe. However, there are a number of things Italy has that Europe does not in general, that the rest of Europe does not. And some of those are vagaries of history. Italy has been a cultural melting pot, a cultural crossroads for its entire history, where you're looking at North Africans, uh, Middle East, Northwestern Europe, Southwestern Europe, which are all distinct cultures. And so you end up with this amalgam uh, throughout the Middle Ages of Western uh, Catholic cultural artifacts, as well as Eastern Orthodox artifacts, as well as Arabic, is Arabic Islamic influence, as well as Spanish Islamic influence, which was its very much own thing, which was already an amalgam that ended up into the whole melting pot of Italian medieval culture. And because of the vagaries of history, some of these artifacts survived better than elsewhere in Europe. For example, um, in Ravenna and in Palermo, there are surviving Byzantine mosaics that you can't find anywhere else in the world because of internal Italian politics in the Middle Ages. By the time the Byzantine uh, patriarch declared that images of people in holy spaces were forbidden, this is, this is no longer okay, everywhere in the Byzantine Empire, they tore down the mosaics, but Ravenna rebelled. They actually threw a rebellion over art. And while they didn't win the rebellion, they did win a dispensation from the patriarch. And so you do have the survival of this incredible 5th, 6th, and 7th century mosaic heritage in Ravenna that you can't find anywhere else in the former Byzantine world, except in Palermo, Sicily, because by the time the Byzantine patriarch was declaring images verboten, Palermo was no longer Byzantine. Palermo had been uh, taken over by a successive waves of cultures where it was first conquered by Arabs and then conquered by Normans and then conquered by the Hohenstaufen Germans and then conquered by uh, the Spanish. And so Palermo avoided that whole uh, political fiasco. So let's dive in. Now, the organization of the handout is such that it is broken down first by region, then by city, and then by attraction, as I mentioned. I am not simply reading this to you. There are going to be some additions I am talking about uh, that are not on the handout. The thing about the handout is I made it the smallest font that I could and still had to cut a number of things because I wanted it to be two pages. I wanted to be able to do a handout that was a single page front and back one, for portability, I don't want to burden my students with a, a fistful of, uh, of papers, as, as lovely as that would be. And second of all is cost. I am a musician by trade, and uh, my budget is not necessarily phenomenal, and I don't want to charge for a handout. So I have kept the handout fairly limited, but in this format where I don't have that limitation, neither do I have the strict time limitation I have when I'm in Arts and Sciences tent number four or wherever I have been assigned for my hour long slot, uh, this may run a bit more than that class does and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity. To further introduce myself, I mentioned I'm a musician. Everything that I'm talking to here with, I believe one exception, uh, that I haven't made it to. I have been to. I travel Italy and Europe, but mainly Italy, whenever I can. As a professional performer, I have certain parts of the year that I have downtime, and I travel to Italy and make my way as a street performer, as a busker performing on street corners, while also getting the opportunity to soak in the local sights and culture. I have been ridiculously lucky, and I am very grateful. So I'm going to start in the big three. If you have not been to the big three of Rome, Florence, and Venice, there is a reason those are the big three. You don't necessarily have to hit all three on a tour, but any given Italy tour, unless you are already very familiar with them, any given Italy tour should include at least one or two of them. Starting off in Rome, and the, uh, the, the region of Lazio, but Lazio is very much dominated by the fact that it is the, uh, the home of Rome. Rome is huge. Rome is massive. There is a lot in Rome. And Rome is not physically huge. You can walk across it in an hour and a half. Rome is culturally huge. I have spent literal months of my cumulative months of my life in Rome. And every time I go back, I still see 
two or three things I've never even heard of prior. The more time I spend in Rome, the more time I want to spend in Rome. So I'm breaking down Rome by neighborhood because it really is that intense. If you go to the neighborhood of Trastevere, it is the heart of medieval Rome. With a whistle. Trastevere is the heart of medieval Rome because... When the barbarians, well, go back earlier, the founding of Rome was on the supposedly legendarily, according to legend, on the Palatine Hill. And Rome was built on seven hilltops in ancient times because the hilltops were defensible. And then as the city grew and the hilltops spread into the valleys, uh, the city grew up. But the hilltops were always the rich part of town. As... Uh, Rome became prosperous and filled with engineering uh, acumen. The aqueducts brought water to the tops of the hills. It's really kind of amazing. You can still see remnants of the aqueducts today. And the system that brought the water from the nearby hilltops, and not nearby hilltops, but the mountains 15, 20, 30 miles away, into the tops of these mountains is, is phenomenal engineering. And the fact that 2,000 years later, there are still standing segments, in some cases, significant lengths. And some of these aqueducts are still running is amazing to me. It's incredible. There are still Roman aqueducts that are sources of water for the city of Rome today. Problem is, is they're pretty leaky and they've got some other issues. But there are numerous public fountains and, uh, and several uh, public sources of drinking water that are still run by the aqueducts. However... When the barbarians took the city, they cut the aqueducts. And by this time, we're talking about the early Middle Ages, and the technology to build the aqueducts, to repair the aqueducts, was no longer there. The money was no longer there, which means that the hilltops were abandoned. Because in the Middle Ages, there wasn't a looming threat from the external surrounding countryside. Um, the original, like I said, the Seven Hills of Rome were refuges, in classical times, but those refuges weren't needed anymore in the Middle Ages. However, what was needed was drinking water and hauling water up the Palatine, up the Aventine, up the uh, Janiculum, up the Capitoline, up the, uh, I'm going to embarrass myself, Quaternine. There are, uh, I used to know all seven, and if you give me a, a minute, I can. But hauling the water up the hills became a royal pain. And so the settlements in the Middle Ages are along the riverbank, and the greatest concentration of them are on either side of the Tiber River in what is today Trastevere, and what I will talk about next across the street in the medieval Jewish ghetto. So in Trastevere, you have a number of medieval sites. As I said, it was one of the medieval centers of Rome. And after that, since the Middle Ages, until fairly recently, Trastevere was a working class neighborhood, which means that there was never enough money in the neighborhood to really tear anything down. If you have the opportunity uh, to check it out, I definitely recommend it. The architecture is still very much in the medieval heritage. And as a big bonus, Trastevere is currently the fine dining and just eating capital of Rome in general. The best food in Rome is generally to be found in Trastevere, and that is where Trastevere's focus is today. However, if you are there for the medieval sites, I highly recommend you check out the church Santa Maria in Trastevere. It is one of my favorite churches uh, anywhere of all time, um, not least of which because I'm a musician, and I believe they still have St. Cecilia, patron of music, buried in the basement. Also, as a busker, the piazza in front of Santa Maria in Trastevere uh, is, uh, or at least has been, I'm not sure if it still is because Rome passed some laws, but it has traditionally been the center of Roman street performing. It has been one of the, the more notable pitches throughout Europe. And I have never played it because there's always a line, and I would rather play someplace that is less trafficked, uh, but where I can do more playing. However, Santa Maria has a very close place in my heart. And it's this stunning, I want to say 10th, possibly 11th, it's definitely Romanesque, uh, stunning church where they have also uh, put Roman uh, engravings hung on the outside. So you have this, uh, again, this sequence of history 
happening in front of you. And right across the river from Trastevere, which benefited in the Middle Ages from the same forces that brought Trastevere to prominence, is the, uh, the Jewish ghetto and the area around the Campo de Fiori. Now the Campo de Fiori, modernly, is a street market during the day and also a hive of restaurants in the night, but they're tourist restaurants. Trastevere is where the locals go to get a good meal. Campo de Fiori is beautiful and the food is fine. I mean, it's Italy. You are, you are rarely going to have a bad meal, but it is a little pricier than you might want to pay. But for the opportunity to dine on the Campo de Fiori, on the piazza, is, uh, is pretty amazing. And as a bonus, in the center of that uh, piazza is a statue of, uh, of Bruni, whose first name I can't remember, who was burned at the stake on that location in, I want to say, 1604. And he looks like the Emperor from Star Wars. He's just got this... And I always wondered why the Emperor was in the piazza until, uh, until I found out the history of the statue. And I'm like, yeah, if they burned me to stake there, I'd probably be pretty cranky too. And because the church burned him at the stake there, whenever the church does anything that Romans don't like, suddenly that statue is buried in flowers as Romans will go to the market, buy a bouquet of flowers and leave it at the feet of the statue in protest of uh, church policy. Now, one of the fun things I mentioned about Trastevere and the ghetto is there is an island between them, and that island is one of the reasons Rome is where it is. Rome was built originally as the intersection, well, one of the reasons it was it rose to prominence rather than staying a selection of seven villages on top of the hills, is that island and the low-lying regions around were the perfect location for a bridge across the Tiber, but you could still sail a boat from the sea up to that point. So it was this amazing crossroads where you could get to the sea and you could cross the river with a bridge. And that island is still a magnificent artifact. Today it's a hospital and it's been a hospital since ancient Roman times when it housed a temple of Asclepius. But that island is dotted with just this incredible uh, medieval architecture and the oldest Roman bridge in the city. right across down I shouldn't say right across but you have Trastevere the ghetto just downstream from them is one other section of Rome that is very medieval and today its most its greatest claim to fame is uh, Santa Maria in Cosmedin uh, which houses a tourist attraction called La Boca de la Verita, which is this essentially Roman manhole cover that's got this face on it and it's got a mouth, which the mouth was originally the drain for the sewers, but there is a legend that if you put your hand in the mouth and tell a lie, the mouth will bite your hand off. And so there's a line always of tourists looking to put their hand in the mouth and take their picture. And... Uh, and it's a really touristy attraction. But the church that houses it is stunning. It's absolutely glorious with this massive campanile, this huge bell tower that just rises to the heavens and uh, is a stunning example of Romanesque architecture, which is personally my favorite. I do appreciate Gothic, but I have to say Romanesque is where my heart is at. Outside of these areas, there are also significant uh, medieval gems in Rome. My personal favorite thing to see in Rome is the Basilica of San Clemente. And San Clemente is cool because it's this stunning, beautiful, high medieval church that is built on the ruins of an older church, which was built on Roman ruins before it. So you go into this church and it's amazing. Any other city, it would be a cathedral, but this is Rome. So it's eh, a church. However, you buy an admission ticket, go into the basement, and there you are in a sixth century church, which because of the rising water table and uh, changes in uh, sediment layers, they had to, to build up the ground when they built the newer church and they used any stone they could find. And so you will see bits of statuary sticking out of various walls. In one notable case, they squared off an, a head of a colossal Roman statue, shoved it in and used it as a brick in the wall. 
and it's uh, it's really really quite something to see. Plus, being a sixth century church has this interesting architecture all of its own. And then you go into the basement of that, and now you're in the excavation of an ancient Roman street with a house temple to Mithras, and it's this phenomenal layer layering of history that is what I love so much about Rome. You get a very similar experience in the tomb of Hadrian, what is today Castle San Angelo, which at the top has, in my opinion, the best view of Rome. But the Castle San Angelo started off as this massive Roman cylindrical tomb to the Emperor Hadrian. In the Middle Ages, they put a castle on top of it, <clears throat> and in the Renaissance, they put a palace on the top of the castle. And so whereas in San Clemente, you were going down through layers of history, in uh, Castel San Angelo, you were going up through layers of history. And it's an amazing experience. And as I said, once you get to the top, in my opinion, it's the best view of Rome. While St. Peter's Dome is higher, it is also significantly farther from the medieval and ancient heart of Rome. Whereas in Castel San Angelo, you stand on the parapet and the city is at your feet. It's, it's amazing. Plus, there's a cute little cafe with a really pretty uh, trestles and the medieval ramparts, and you'll, you'll spend a little more than you would elsewhere in the city, but uh, it's a great, stop to, uh, a great spot to stop for a cappuccino. But only before 10 a.m. You, you stop drinking cappuccino. After that, you go to a latte. So Lazio, the region... I mentioned is dominated by Rome. However, there is also another city that I think is really stunning for its medieval heritage, and that is Viterbo. It's not far outside of Rome. And Viterbo has, uh, has a few worthy sites, but one that's really notable is it's got almost its entire medieval circuit of city wall and tower system intact. There are a few gaps. Uh, there are a few places they've run modern roads where they just knocked a hole in the wall. But as a general rule, most of it survives, most of it stands. And there are quite a few towers that survive within the city, and this is very rare. In the Middle Ages, a sign of wealth and status was to turn your urban house into a massive 100-foot tower. And there are a number of reasons for this, aside from the obvious uh, status associations, and feel free to make any jokes that you care to about the size of your tower. But one of the benefits is the biggest problem in medieval Italy for lawlessness was rioting. There were lots and lots of civil disturbances. And if your family owned a tower, you didn't have to worry about it. These towers were, uh, were secure areas where if a townhouse was looted, that was terrible. But if your family was killed, that's awful. If you have a tower, however, you can take refuge in the tower, bar the lower floors, and rest assured that you can wait out the riot. The problem with this, from a civic point of view, is the fact that knowing they were immune to riots, noble families would incite riots in order to harm the interests of their opponents, of their uh, enemies, of other noble families. And so you ended up with a lot of civil disturbance because various people and families would start riots and then not have to worry about it. And so the civil authorities eventually almost universally said, no, 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 that's it for the towers, they're gone chopped down the towers. And if you're wandering through medieval areas of Italy, you will see occasionally a three-story building that's about 10 feet wide. And it's a fairly curious shape. And it makes a lot more sense if you remember that originally it was probably about 80 feet tall. However, like I said, in most places, the towers were cut down. But in Viterbo, there are still a number of them surviving, as I said, in addition to the circuit of the city wall and its tower system. Moving on from Rome, if we just hop on a train and head to Florence, central Italy is a whole different world. The thing about Italy is Italy's unification as a country is very recent. And so Italy is still very much a collection of localities. In Italy, there is a word for this called Campanilissimo, which is you are not loyal to your country, you are not loyal to your city, you are loyal to the local campanile, you are local to the bell tower closest to where you were born. Uh, the closest analog that may be familiar to you is uh, people born within the sound of St. Mary's Church in London is the traditional definition of a cockney. But in Italy, it's everywhere. Every city has this very 
very local identity. And so you find that you have significant differences when you go from place to place, much less when you go region to region. So going from Lazio to Tuscany brings us to Florence. I'm not going to talk much about Florence. There is a wealth of opportunity and material on Florence. However, as a quick overview, Florence is a medieval city. We think of it as the hub of the Renaissance. Because of that wealth inequality I mentioned earlier, a lot of incredible Renaissance art is located there, as well as, of course, it being the birthplace of the Renaissance. However, Rome as a, Rome, Florence as a city still has the fundamental urban fabric of a medieval settlement because the wealth that built the city was the medieval wool trade. It wasn't until later that the, uh, the banking trade created this massive wealth inequality and laid the foundations for the Renaissance. So if you're walking around Florence, the odds are really good. Whatever building you're looking at is probably medieval. My favorite of such buildings is the Bargello. Now the Bargello is a two for one because it is currently the Renaissance Sculpture Museum of Florence. A number of years ago, they pulled a lot of the statuary out of the Uffizi Museum, put it in the Bargello, and most tourists have never heard of it. So for a fairly cheap ticket and zero line, you will enter into an empty museum for the opportunity to stand in a room with three Michelangelos, four Cellinis, and two Donatellas. It is amazing. It is my favorite museum in, uh, in the world possibly tied with Villa Borghese in Rome, but it is an amazing museum. But before it was a museum, it was medieval city hall. And after it was the medieval city hall, once the uh, Palazzo dei Signori came, uh, now known as the Palazzo Vecchio, uh, became the center of government, the Bargello, which is just down the street, became a prison in the late Middle Ages and through uh, what we know as the Renaissance period. Which makes it an extra interesting layer of, uh, of architecture. The fact that you have this incredible building that's filled with this stunning amount of sculpture. Another notable and very prominent medieval uh, remnant of uh, remnant of medieval Florence is the baptistry of the cathedral. Now the cathedral is a gothic structure. We know it as the height of the Renaissance because they didn't manage to put a dome on it until the 15th century, but fundamentally it is a 14th century international gothic structure. And the baptistry is significantly older. It is Romanesque. It is, it is old enough that in the high middle ages, they thought it was the remnants of a medieval, of a, they thought it was the remnants of an ancient temple to, uh, I believe, to uh, Mars is who they thought it was to. They thought it was an ancient temple, but really it's a stunning 10th century piece of architecture. And then, of course, uh, one of my favorite places uh, in Florence, not least because I wrote a song in the courtyard, is uh, the Church of Santa Maria Novella. Santa Maria Novella may ring a bell to those of you who have been to Italy because Santa Maria Novella is the name of the main train station in Florence because it's right across the street from this church. So if you uh, have a layover in the Florence train station, which is not unlikely because it is a massive transit hub, I definitely recommend that you take a half hour, go across the street, check out this church. It is amazing with this stunning courtyard and series of cloisters and is... Uh, is absolutely a work of art. Now, from Florence, of course, the next major attraction we know is Pisa. And everyone goes to see the Leaning Tower. But while you're there to see the Leaning Tower, look 20 feet over and check out the cathedral. The Pisa Cathedral is another one of my absolute favorite churches in Europe. This one's probably top three. The Pisa Cathedral is amazing. It is essentially a found art project because in the 10th and 11th centuries, they took all of these bits of Roman columns that are around and stuck them on the facade of this church and put them in the interior. It is this amazing amalgam of, uh, of ancient Roman ruins incorporated, not incorporated, reused into a, high, into a Romanesque medieval sculpt, uh, structure. And it is stunning. 
stunning. And of course, the baptistry across the way from the cathedral is even more interesting because it took so long to build that the bottom layers are in Romanesque architecture and halfway up it changes to Gothic. So if you know what you're looking for, Romanesque has a curved arch, Gothic has a pointy arch. If you look closely at the baptistry of the Pisa Cathedral, and feel free to Google image search that now, but if you look at that baptistry, it's this amazing uh, transition in styles. It's also got incredible acoustics, and uh, every so often when you go in there, there, there's a regular interval. It might be five minutes, it might be ten minutes. They play a recording of an opera singer because it has, I believe, a five-second echo just from the natural acoustics of the stone. Having talked about two baptistries, I should probably go into detail about what that is. In the Middle Ages, in the early Middle Ages, in the late ancient period even, there was a tradition that if you had not been baptized, you weren't supposed to go into a cathedral. You could go into other churches, but the cathedral was only for the baptized. And one reason this is important is because in the late ancient era, it was traditional to wait until later in life to be baptized. We're not talking infant baptism. We are talking about... Uh, a conversion experience. But the thing about baptism is it gave you a blank slate regarding sin. So a number of people who are hedging their bets who had converted uh, from older religions or who just weren't necessarily that devout would wait until they were fairly close to death, get baptized, and then try not to sin before they died in order to, uh, to go straight to heaven. And so because there is a tradition where the cathedral is only for the faithful who have been baptized, it leads you to the conundrum of how do you baptize people when the cathedral is the only church in town? And the answer to that was a separate church ex uh, exclusively, or at least primarily, for baptisms. And they all have a very similar shape. They tend to be round or hexagonal or uh, octagonal. And the very first one was the uh, primary, what is still the preeminent church in uh, Catholicism, San Giovanni in Laterno. Uh, St. Peter's gets a lot of press, but San Giovanni is technically the seat of the bishopric of Rome, which is the source of the papacy. But San Giovanni in Laterno, the cathedral of Rome, has this stunning, late, ancient baptistry that served as the model for all of these medieval baptistries that I am talking about. And they tend to be kind of amazing. So in Pisa, you've got the cathedral, you have the tower, and you have a graveyard, and you have the baptistry, and a lot of people never leave the Piazza dei Miracoli, unless it is to just walk along the short pedestrian way and grab lunch. Uh, again, it's Italy, so you're going to have a good lunch, but it's going to cost more than it would elsewhere. But if you go into the main drag of town, Pisa is still has one street of glorious medieval uh, architecture, and the reason it's only one street is because this little thing called World War II uh, the, uh, the Germans retreating across the Arno uh, blew up a lot of stuff and were under attack. The Allied commander was actually given the command to destroy the Leaning Tower of Pisa because it was being used as an observation post. And he, uh, he delayed following the order until it was late enough that the, uh, that the German Wehrmacht had retreated. And because of that, the leaning, power, the leaning Tower survives to this day. Conversely, the Ponte Vecchio in, uh, in Florence, which is this, the, the bridge across the Arno, which I should have mentioned, this stunning, incredible piece of, uh, of, of medieval uh, architecture, as you have all these buildings tacked onto this old bridge. Uh, when the uh, Germans were retreating across the Arno, they were given uh, the order to blow all the bridges. And all of the bridges, bridges were blown up. If you look in Florence, all the bridges are post-1950, except the Ponte Vecchio. And the reason was because the retreating uh, German Wehrmacht commander couldn't bring himself to blow it up. He collapsed a building on either end in order to block the street, but he didn't blow up the bridge. World War II made a big impact on a lot of uh, European structures. And it's one reason that some of the Italian medieval attractions do still survive the way they do because uh, except for certain places, Italy was not nearly the center of bombardment that, for example, Germany got. So a lot of German tourists come to Italy to look at what their country used to look like.
Where was I? Pisa. So Pisa is full of this glorious Romanesque architecture. The Romanesque architecture of, uh, of Pisa is incredible, is absolutely phenomenal because it was one of the birthplaces of Romanesque architecture. The Cathedral of Pisa was revolutionary and it spread throughout Tuscany and especially through Pisa. And so again, as I mentioned, because they had so many Roman remnants around, because Pisa had been uh, previously a Roman seaport, Pisa has this uh, wealth of Roman ruins that were all borrowed and stolen and became later uh, medieval Romanesque architecture. So Santa Maria della Spina is amazing. San Michele in Foro, the site of the ancient Roman Forum, which is still the heart of the city today, is amazing. If uh, you go around the Piazza dei Miracoli, it's still bordered on, uh, on two sides by the ancient uh, not the ancient, but by the medieval city wall. There are little bits of it that survived, but because the city outgrew the wall, they knocked down most of it. And uh, yeah, Pisa is amazing. There's one particular church I wish I could remember the name of. Uh, no, it is. Uh, it is Santa Maria della Spina. I just talked about it. That uh, It's an 11th century church, and it's covered in 15th century graffiti because a candidate for local office decided to turn the church facade into a billboard. And, uh, and it's still there in Latin. And it's, uh, it's, it's kind of amazing to see this, this historical artifact that's just, wow. Also, as a busker, it's a fun place to play. However, as much as I love Pisa, there's not a lot there. So if you are going to Pisa, I highly recommend you combine it with a trip to Lucca, which is fairly close by, only about 15, 20 minutes away by train. Lucca is amazing. And Lucca has the Renaissance distinction of being one of the few small independent republics to survive. Florence kept trying to conquer it the way they had conquered Pisa, the way they conquered Siena, the way they conquered most of Tuscany. They kept trying to take Lucca and they never managed it. And the reason they never managed it is this massive 16th century wall that was later continued to be fortified in the 17th century. But the foundation of this wall is 16th century. And it's not what we think of as medieval because by the 16th century, cannon are a thing. And so the 16th century wall that surrounds Lucca is this massive rampart, this massive structure that is built to absorb cannon fire. And inside this massive 16th century wall is this stunning, beautiful gem of a medieval core. So you have this 16th century wall surviving, surrounding all of this 10th, 11th, and 12th century architecture that is just filled with these little beautiful gems. Now in the Middle Ages, Lucca was not that big a deal, but it was significant, the Renaissance as well. But then it declined. So when Napoleon came through, he took it without a shot, so it was never looted. And in World War II, the city was never important enough to defend or to bomb, and so it survives in excellent condition. And having mentioned Napoleon, he had given the city to his niece, who then turned that 16th century wall into a walking park. And so you have this beautiful wall that is a delightful way to spend an afternoon, either renting bikes and riding around it, or as I prefer to at a little slower pace, just take a nice stroll. It's about, I believe, two miles and, uh, and an absolute joyful way to spend an afternoon looking out over the countryside as you look outside the wall and then looking into the city of the medieval core from the, uh, from the, vantage, from the vantage point of the walking park. Now, I mentioned earlier, when we're talking about places Florence has conquered, there is Siena. Now, Siena had a huge medieval heritage because it was a very wealthy and important city. However, in the early 15th century, I believe, Florence conquered Siena. And when Siena was conquered territory, Florence cut off the sources of their wealth. And so Siena is trapped in amber in that way because its prosperity declined so much they never tore anything down and it is still at heart a 14th century city which makes it amazing to wander through today and uh, i mentioned the big three of italian tourism if there was a fourth city it would be siena siena is stunning 
and incredible. And if you climb the Torre del Manja, this massive civic tower at the beginning, at the, uh, at the center of town, you get this stunning vantage point of the city of Siena as well as the surrounding countryside. It is magnificent. I love Siena. Siena's fantastic. But while we're talking about medieval Tuscany, the place that I cannot neglect is San Gimignano. And San Gimignano is famous for its towers. I mentioned earlier that a lot of medieval cities had a lot of medieval towers that were really tall, uh, were uh, erected by the families to survive civil disturbances. However, in San Gimignano, they weren't knocked down to the same extent as they were elsewhere. Now, they were still knocked down. There are still about a dozen of them of 70 some, but more survived than I believe anywhere else. And certainly uh, they are more densely packed. You know, I mentioned in Viterbo, there are a number of them, but they are not within this small, stunning, scenic area that they are in San Gimignano. And I, I highly recommend it. It's a little bit off the path, but definitely, definitely worth seeing. From Tuscany, I'm going to go to the neighboring region of Umbria. which has a soft spot in my heart because it's where my grandmother was from. And Umbria has an ancient history. Umbria is significantly older than Rome. Umbria was the center of the Etruscan culture. And many of the medieval cities of Umbria began as Etruscan settlements. Now, as we are getting away from some of the bigger cities, defensibility still mattered. And so the ancient hill towns, like in Rome, I had mentioned the hilltops, uh, Rome potentially started, I mean, Remus and Romulus notwithstanding, potentially started as an Etruscan outpost, or at least was conquered by the Etruscans fairly early on. The, uh, the hill towns of Umbria remained important and remained viable. And so all of these little hill towns are still this wealth of medieval Italian architecture and are really stunning to enjoy. The biggest one, of course, being the capital city of Umbria, Perugia. Now, Perugia, as I mentioned with Siena, had an event that was really bad for the town and really good for us, which was that in 1505, I want to say, uh, the city was brought into the Papal States by Pope uh, Il Terribile, Horrible, uh, Julius, Julius II. And Pope Julius conquered Perugia and proceeded to tax it to pieces, which means the city is being taxed to such an extent there is no money in the city. So nothing really was erected after 1505. And it is this beautifully preserved 15th century medieval city on top of this sprawling series of hills with a stunning view of the surrounding countryside. Perugia is glorious. Next to Perugia, not far away, is the city of Assisi. It is close enough that they tried to do a joint, uh, a, uh, a joint candidacy for the European city of culture a couple years ago. Matera won, and Matera is really cool, so I don't begrudge that. But Assisi is close enough to Perugia that they are easily done together, staying in one and visiting the other. Uh, it will be cheaper to stay in Perugia, but because it's at the top of the hill, uh, they're both at the top of the hill. They're not necessarily easy to get to by train. There is a significant walk, cab ride, or bus involved on both ends. However, they are geographically close together. And Assisi has another one of my favorite churches, the Double Cathedral of St. Francis. So Assisi has been a pilgrimage site, which in medieval terms is a tourist site, uh, for hundreds of years. It was a pilgrimage site essentially the minute that St. Francis died. And this cathedral houses his tomb. So you have the basement that houses his tomb, which is this beautiful little intimate, uh, very holy feeling place. And then above that, you have a cathedral. And then above that, they built another big church at 90 degree angle. So you have this double church, the bottom one, I believe, being covered in frescoes by Gioro. So if you're into late medieval, early Renaissance art, as well as being a significant uh, source of medieval architecture, the church is phenomenal. Now the frescoes were seriously, seriously damaged by an earthquake a couple years ago, but has now reopened. The art preservationists did a meticulous and incredible job of restoring those frescoes, of those, uh, those freschi. And honestly, 
I can't see the damage, even knowing that it was there. And uh, yeah, just massive shout out to uh, people working in the arts who managed to do it. In some cases, they said they were taking bits of plaster the size of a grain of rice and figuring out where it went and putting it back. It is magnificent and meticulous work. So, hopping off the worksheet, while I'm in Umbria, I've got to talk about Spoleto and Spello. They're also very close together. Spoleto hosts the Umbria Jazz Festival, so if you're a music fan in Italy in the summer, I believe in the month of August, it is a significant, significant event and is a beautiful medieval hill town and has a collection of pre-1600 garments in the local museum. It is not a big enough museum to really warrant going out of your way for, but if you're checking out Umbrian Hill Towns, definitely make a stop. It is a small collection, but there are a few real gems in it. Spello being a nearby Umbrian Hill Town that is uh, magnificent. It's glorious. It's just this walk of this winding maze of medieval streets. Moving away from Umbria, elsewhere in central Italy, we're going to go to Bologna. Now, Bologna is a massive medieval center. Bologna was a huge deal in the Middle Ages, hosted the first European university, and was a, uh, a very prosperous and important city in the Middle Ages, which means it has a lot of medieval stuff left. The city wall is gone. They leveled the wall, turned it into a ring road. Uh, so if you look at a map of Bologna, it's very obvious where the map, where the wall used to be by looking at the map. But Bologna is incredible, and the centerpiece is the iconic Due Torre. Now you think of the leaning tower of Pisa as leaning, but they have these two towers that are just at this really weird angles. One of them is only half height because it started leaning so badly so early on, they realized if they kept going, it was going to collapse. But the Due Torre are just... Iconic, incredible, and you can climb to the top. Although if you're planning to attend classes at the university, I recommend against it because there's a local tradition that uh, if you climb to the top of the tower as a student, you will never graduate. Oh, Santo Stefano is in Bologna, which is the sequence of a number of interlinked churches, uh, which is really cool and also has the added uh, distinction of being a place where Mozart used to go to practice his piano when he was in town before he failed out of the university. Little historical note there. Moving on from Bologna, as I said, if we're going the big three, we're going to hit Rome, then we're going to hit Florence and Tuscany, then Bologna is the next on the train route, finally culminating in Venezia. Venice is Venice. Venice is amazing. Venice is incredible and it's sinking so uh, once they let Americans back into the country, I do recommend you see it. I have had the opportunity to see this flooded city. It was the best of all worlds because the city only flooded two inches, so it wasn't that big of an inconvenience for me. However, I got to see the beauty that is the Aqua Alta, the high water. It was, uh, it's magnificent, it's incredible, it's Venice. While you're in Venice, and you're noticing all of the Renaissance architecture, the thing to look for, if you're looking uh, for the medieval attractions, as I am describing in this class, look at the bell towers. A lot of times a massive a church was given a massive reconstruction in the Renaissance and or the Baroque period, but they rarely bothered to update the bell tower. So if you want to see the greatest collection of medieval architecture remaining in Venice, the bell towers are where it's at. Also, the local style of... Uh, of architecture was a, an amalgam of Renaissance and Gothic. So you end up with these really interesting arch shapes that are reminiscent of Gothic, but a little Eastern because they have these dips in. Because Venice, as I mentioned earlier, was a, uh, a cultural crossroads to the East. Nowhere more apparent than its massive medieval cathedral with its domes and its mosaics and its wealth of glorious medieval architecture. The, uh, I'm sorry, it's not the cathedral. The Cathedral of Venice is really boring. We always think of St. Mark's as being at the cathedral. I always think of St. Mark's as being cathedral. It's a chapel. Technically, it was the private chapel of the Doge, whose palace is right next door. And... Uh, yeah, so St. Mark's Basilica, not cathedral, but basilica, is a stunning wealth 
a very medieval architecture, as is the Campanile, the bell tower right outside, although that's a reconstruction because in 1900 it fell down. It lasted a thousand years, but they rebuilt it again meticulously, and, uh, and it is still a glory today. Wandering off from Venice, if we go into Terra Firma, if we hit Padua, site of, I believe, the second oldest university in Europe, Padua, it's way up there. Pisa is also pretty old. And then, of course, you get Florence and Oxford, followed by Cambridge. Uh, but Padua is today, is today still a massive university town. I'm going to go back a bit. In Bologna, Big highlight, if you can read Italian or puzzle through with Spanish, the museums of the university are amazing. There's a medieval museum in Bologna that is fantastic, and there's a music museum, a musical instrument museum that I'm personally in love with. Uh, Bologna has all these small museums affiliated with, the, with the, uh, the university that sadly Padua doesn't have, but Padua does have an incredible wealth of later medieval architecture. So for example, the Basilica of St. Anthony is this stunning work of architecture uh, for St. Anthony of Padova. It's a massive pilgrimage site even today. The Palazzo della Ragione, the Palace of Reason, is absolutely glorious. And again, the medieval university buildings are definitely something to behold. Padua is a gem. I really, really like it. And if you are doing a trip in northern Italy, it is a, uh, a good base of operations if you can find a place to stay. Dropping away from Padua, I'm going to hit two cities that I didn't make room for on the worksheet. And it's a shame because they're incredible. Those cities are Vicenza and Verona. Now, Vicenza, I'm going to have to say more of a Renaissance city, but I've got to make the point that if we're looking at pre-1600, Vicenza is amazing because Palladio built significant portion of the city he built its city hall he built a bunch of private palaces vicenza is this wealth of of late 16th century architecture it's an absolute gem it was the inspiration uh these palladium buildings were the inspiration for monticello by thomas jefferson uh vicenza is amazing hopping down the street from there is verona where we lay our scene verona is a big tourist town now because Romeo and Juliet is set there. There is a house reputed to be Juliet's house, which was owned by the historical family of, uh, that inspired the Capulets, but it's fiction. It is fiction. I went there with a Shakespeare scholar who was like, this is all wrong. There's no orange orchard. There's no, there's no wall in the right place. Uh, but there is a balcony, and so uh, there is a, a really charming tradition of people leaving love letters tacked up against the wall on the entryway. But Verona is a beautiful medieval city, lots of medieval architecture. The, the castle is stunning. Uh, if you look at my, uh, my social media on Facebook, I use a, a picture of the castle of Verona is, uh, is my... Uh, I don't remember what they call it, not the profile picture, but the background picture, the big banner at the top of my page. If we head south a little bit, we get to Ravenna, which I mentioned earlier for its mosaics. Ravenna has this wealth of early medieval architecture that is incomparable anywhere else. You have all of these 5th and 6th and 7th century churches and mosaics that just don't survive anywhere else because it was a very important city in the early Middle Ages. It was the last capital of the Roman Empire and then became the uh, Italian base of operations as the Byzantine Empire tried to reconquer Italy and it remained a Byzantine city for quite a long time despite rebelling in order to keep its mosaics. Uh, Ravenna was still the foothold in Italy of uh, the Byzantine Empire for quite a number of centuries. Sorry, I'm reading over the, uh, the list of attractions in Ravenna, and San Vitale is a glorious church. The Mausoleum of Theodoric is this really interesting uh, late Roman building, one of the last uh, monumental buildings of the Roman Empire, and basically they reused an ancient Roman bathtub as the coffin of Theodoric, which is always kind of entertaining. The Arian Baptistry, we are not talking about the 
odious ideology of Arianism. We are talking about the uh, Christian heresy of Arianism. We are talking about the Bishop Arius, who said that the, the Trinity uh, didn't exist, uh, basically was a Unitarian belief. And Arian Christianity, again, A-R-I-A-N, not the hateful awfulness of A-R-Y-A-N uh, ideology. Arian theology was uh, very much in vogue in Ravenna because as the last capital of the Roman Empire, the last few emperors were barbarians. And those barbarians hadn't converted to Catholic Christianity. They had been converted to Arian Christianity. And so you still have a number of buildings that have Arian imagery dating from the 5th century. The Arian baptistry, uh, again, being a baptistry of the cathedral. You have the uh, baptistry of Neon, which is the actual baptistry of the city because it is the Catholic baptistry, being two different technical religions. Uh, you had uh, the Catholic cathedral and the Arian cathedral, and each one had their own baptistry. And they both have very significant 5th century uh, mosaics, possibly because they were competing with each other, and uh, competition tends to breed a certain amount of uh, one-upmanship. You also have a uh, ruin of the, the late ancient early medieval Palazzo di Teodori, Teodorico, the remnant of the imperial palace of Theodoric, which is also kind of cool. So now wandering south to Puglia, or Apulia, as the locals call it. Apulia is the boot heel of Italy. It is the stiletto heel of the boot. And Apulia is full of all of that fantastic crusader uh, architecture that I had mentioned earlier, because Apulia was often uh, the farthest you could walk by land, walking being obviously a fairly cheap way to travel, and uh, then catch a boat there. So there are a series of fishing villages along the coast of Puglia that started off as fishing villages and then became this massive hub of crusader traffic and then became fishing villages once again. So they never were invaded, they were never looted, they were never bombed. It's just this tiny little fishing village with this massive glorious 11th century cathedral, 12th century cathedral, most notably of which is Trani. Now Trani has a stunning cathedral. I love it, it's amazing. It's also got a castle has an amazing palace, and it has a former Templar hospital church, uh, which is definitely a uh, worth seeing. The regional capital is Bari, and the city of Bari is not great. However, the city of Bari contains the medieval city of Bari, and modern Bari is in a different place than medieval Bari. Uh, very fortunately, they moved the port when they started doing modern shipping, uh, first with cranes and now with containers. They moved the port down the coast, which means that the medieval port of Bari, what they call Bari Vecchia, the old city of Bari, is still very well preserved and very, very beautiful. Now, in the past, Bari Vecchia has been a little bit shady. It's been gradually being reclaimed, uh, gentrified, if you will. And it used to be somewhat hazardous at night, but it's now less and less so and is the uh, scene of a fairly thriving bed and breakfast uh, scene if you, uh, if you are interested. I, I definitely recommend it. I am a big fan of Bari. It's beautiful. It is also a regional transit hub. So you can get anywhere in Apulia uh, from Bari. And if you're taking trains, Bari is the only way to get to Matera which I mentioned earlier is a winner of the European uh, Cultural City of the Year 2017, 2018, fairly recently. And Matera is a glory. Matera is weird. <laughs> so you may have seen Matera if you saw the Mel Gibson film Passion of the Christ. Because in that film, uh, Matera plays the role of Jerusalem. And Matera has been continuously occupied for, I think, 5,000 years? It's some ridiculous number. The city is still home to Bronze Age settlements that they're still turning up archaeological remains in caves. And the medieval city was still in caves. The modern city until the 1950s was still very much in these caves, these uh, Sasi stones. The Sasi 
of Matera are incredible. They uh, are no longer inhabited. In the 50s, uh, the government noticed that the infant mortality in Matera was off the charts and absolutely ridiculous. And part of the problem was, was these medieval habitations were vastly overcrowded. So for example, buildings, not buildings, but caves that have been used for stabling for centuries were turned into homes as overcrowding happened. And it was the overcrowding that was a massive contributor. And so the government kicked everyone out of their caves, but they have preserved quite a few. So there are some that you can go into and they are preserved as they once were. And there are others that you can just walk in the right neighborhood and they're abandoned. And they're caves and they're, they're man-made caves. You know, they're 20 feet, 30 feet deep with, a, with ledges that were beds uh, and various uh, platforms that were kitchens, etc. But they are... Uh, are safe you just wander in wander around and it's it's kind of an amazing amazing place but back to bari back to puglia matera is a neighboring region of basilicata the uh the city of ostuni is a glory the entire city is whitewashed and sits on a hill just inland from the coast and it is glorious if i recall correctly it's got a little more gothic architecture it's got a little more later period stuff and uh i may be misremembering on that but i remember this one particular gothic span that i just sat for 15 minutes staring at this building because it was incredible and the cathedral and the bishop's palace uh both are are near each other and very definitely worth google uh google searching then there is the city of Barletta. As a busker, it did not do me any favors, but it is a very pretty city and was well worth a visit. It has a castle. However, the uh, castle has been significantly modified over the years. However, as you go inward into the castle, the inner bits and especially the cellars are very much medieval. And when I was there, they, had a, uh, they were using the cellar to host an art uh, display, an art demonstration, an art gallery. And so you have this incredible medieval cellar uh, that has a lot of um, modern contemporary art hanging from it. But at one point, I just remember walking into this dome cellar beneath, uh, beneath a tower and clapping and just hearing clap, pa, 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 as the echoes just like, pa, 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 pa. it was amazing. I wish I could have uh, brought a dulcimer down there and seen what that could do. Now, uh, there are other cool things that are going on in Barletta, uh, the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre, the Cathedral of Santa Maria Maggiore, but my favorite museum in the area is this tiny little local museum, the Museum of the Challenge, the Cellar of the Challenge. And what happened with the challenge was a series of, uh, of Italian and Spanish knights were hanging out drinking, and... Uh, and one thing led to another, and someone said something about someone else's prowess, and uh, there was a big fight outside and a challenge of honor, and I don't remember who won. I suspect it was the Spanish, because I remember thinking it was somewhat ironic that they uh, had erected a museum to a fight they lost. But the challenge is a big part of the local mythology of Barletta. And this cellar is really cool because they have reconstructed it in the way a medieval tavern would have been furnished. And so it is a, a really interesting little uh, living history, not quite living history, but a, a really interesting display of in situ of the actual place where these hap things happened in that time of what it would have looked like when it went down. And again, the challenge is a very small piece of very local folklore, but is uh, really fun. Further down, at the very tip, towards the tip of the boot, is Lecce. Lecce is one of my favorite cities, L-E-C-C-E, -E, Lecce. And Lecce is often called the Florence of the South. And similarly, it has a uh, medieval foundation, a medieval uh, fabric of the city, with a very strong Baroque overlay. And the way that Florence has a Renaissance overlay, Lecce's is Baroque. And uh, I believe that the Basilica of Santa Croce was once described by someone as uh, having a facade, the carvings of which looked like a demon having a nightmare. It's just this incredible Rococo uh, Baroque 
fantastic series of carvings. And the reason is, one of the reasons, is the local sandstone would be quarried. And when it was quarried, it would still have a certain amount of water in the stone. And so it was very easy to carve. But as the water evaporated out of the stone, it would harden up. And so it was a dream to work with for a sculptor. And so they did some phenomenal, ridiculous things. But unfortunately, a lot of these statues are now ha statues and sculptures and carvings are now having problems because sandstone in the long term, 500 years on, is brittle and uh, local air pollution is causing problems. Acid rain is dissolving them. And so some of these sculptures and the buildings themselves aren't in the best shape, but the, uh, the most famous ones have been pretty well protected. And uh, especially the ones that are attached to the massive uh, important churches of the city. Lecce is also the host of a uh, modern university and it's a very fun university. It's one of the uh, more, uh, artsy university. So for example, there is a university in Bari and everyone's a business student. It looks very buttoned down and proper. And Italians in general with their appearance tend to be fairly conservative. But when you get to Lecce, that's when you start to see facial piercings and purple hair. And as someone who, uh, who really enjoys college campuses, Lecce feels a little more like what I think of as a student body. And uh, I rather enjoy the atmosphere there as well for that. Heading north from Puglia takes us to the central Adriatic coast, Le Marche, the marches, the borderlands uh, between the south and the north. And there are two cities there that are very much worth describing. The first is Ascoli Piceno. And Ascoli Piceno has a wealth of medieval towers, some incredible churches, and a, uh, a castle, which is really interesting because it is, it's basically a keep. It's what I would call either a large tower or a small castle. It's right on the edge there. And the Forte Malatesta is named after the Malatesta family, which comes from the Italian for headache, which makes me wonder where that nickname came from. But the, uh, the Forte Malatesta is a, is a really cool little castle. And again, some phenomenal churches, the cathedral, its baptistry, uh, San Francesco, San Vittorio, San Agostino, San Pietro Martiro, San Tommaso. There are some really Beautiful gems, but just to walk the streets is a delight. Uh, Ascoli Piceno is a gem. It is absolutely beautiful. Not too far away is the city of Urbino, which you may know if you are a fan of Italian Renaissance history. Urbino was a massive source of Renaissance patronage with uh, Count Federico de Montefeltro. And Urbino is, again, like Florence, fundamentally a medieval town with this massive Renaissance palazzo on the edge of town because the, uh, the uh, ruler of the town, Federico de Montefeltro, uh, built this massive palace, and he was a huge patron of the arts. This is where Il Cortigiano, uh, the courtier by Castiglione, was uh, written, and it's where the events transcribed in the book took place in a series of conversations in the, chamber of this, in the chambers of this palace. But again, outside the palace, the city is very, very medieval. It does have another Renaissance highlight, however, in the childhood home of the artist Raphael. And Raphael was the son of a painter. And so the house has been uh, remodeled as a museum to Raphael's childhood. And being the child of an artist and an artist himself is a really good look at what that sort of living looked like in the late Middle Ages. Also, going back to the palace, in an SCA context, one of the things that I really enjoy about the Ducal Palace of Urbino is the fact that Federico was promoted halfway through its construction. And so all of the, uh, the ground level and floor paneling ornamentation says FC as the, uh, as the monogram, FC, Federico Conte, Count Federico. However, all of the ceilings talk about Fedux, Duke Federico where it's abbreviated F-E capital D-U-X, Fedux, because uh, all of the ground level ornamentation was when Federico was still a count. He lobbied and managed to get promotion of his terrain from a county to a duchy, making him a duke. And then the later things that were completed, notably the ceilings and the, uh, the uh, painting and plaster work in the ceilings, 
were uh, were therefore decorated with his new title of Duke. And having seen a lot of SCA uh, dukes and duchesses who essentially have their county coronets modified with the strawberry leaves, uh, when I was in the Palazzo Verbino, it felt very much at home as a Skadian. Now, hopping back across Italy brings us to the northwest. These are some of my favorite parts of Italy. I'm going to go now to Genoa, which is my all-time favorite city. Yeah, I'm going to make that blatant like statement. My all-time favorite city. I love it. It doesn't have a lot of green space, so I can't stay there for more than a week without starting to get depressed because it's built along a medieval model where parks were not a thing until the Enlightenment. And so it has very, very, very little green space. However, it is the largest preserved medieval quarter in Europe. A lot of the upper stories to the, uh, to the buildings took significant damage in the bombing and shelling campaigns of World War II. But the structures from the ground level up to the first two floors are generally authentic. And uh, about of a third, I want to say it's a third of the city, uh, survived. So two-thirds of the upper stories were, were demolished and some horrific things happened in the shelling and bombing campaigns. There are some really awful anecdotes of, uh, of what the population went through because Genoa was a major industrial port. It has been a major industrial port since the early Middle Ages. It doesn't have much of a Roman history, but even from the early Middle Ages, it is a sheltered port that became a very, very, very important city. And until uh, until the mid 16th century went head to head against Venice, having defeated all of its prior rivals. Genoa beat Amalfi, and then we're in competition with Pisa and won that one. And then uh, we're in competition with Venice and lost to Venice just in time for Venice to be overwhelmed by, uh, by the Ottomans and then lose its prominence due to trade uh, by the Portuguese in, uh, in the Eastern trade routes. But Genoa was a big deal, and Genoa has been a big deal since the 9th century. So there is a lot of remaining medieval uh, architecture, decoration, sculpture, and beauty. And I have stayed in Airbnb, for example, with an oak beam four times my diameter through the ceiling. It was an upper level, uh, upper level apartment, and uh, my host was, uh, was really nice. And uh, just doing the math on it, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was a 10th century room in a 10th century building because everything very much looked original. And uh, yeah, ah, Genoa, love Genoa. The Cathedral of San Lorenzo is a delight. Uh, it has a remnant of the bombing and the shelling campaigns in it. Uh, there is a shell that hit the church but failed to detonate and it is currently set up in the corner with a little plaque talking about the miracle of the dud bomb that did not blow up the cathedral. And then uh, possibly my favorite site in the town are this Porta Soprano, the High Gate, where uh, you have this massive set of two entrance gateway towers to the middle medieval city that are, uh, are absolutely stunning. And personally, myself having a fondness for the 16th century, if we go a little bit later than the medieval era, there is also a street called the Golden Way, Via Aurea, that is uh, very, very, very much uh, a 16th century street because the city declined in prominence after losing out to Venice, but it still was very, very wealthy. It was still an incredibly wealthy port town. And so it did have the wealth inequality that classified uh, that created the Renaissance. And so you do have this one street on the edge of town of incredibly fancy Renaissance palazzi that are now all museums and it's really a joy to, uh, to explore. But the winding streets of Genoa where the narrow little six feet wide alleyways is uh, one of my favorite places to wander and explore. And there's so much of it, it's huge. Going north from Genoa, I'm gonna to go to Bergamo. Bergamo is just east of Milano. Now Milan doesn't have a lot of medieval to recommend it. Uh, the cathedral is a monument to 14th century international Gothic style. The cathedral is amazing. There are some Renaissance remnants. Uh, of course, the Last Supper by da Vinci is amazing. Uh, the castle, the medieval castle of Milano is really cool, but the vast majority of Milano was bombed to bits. And so there's very little of the Middle Ages that survives in Milan. But if you go, 40 minutes down the road to Bergamo. Bergamo is still a beautifully preserved town. 
And so as a medieval town, this, the high city of Bergamo, La Città Alta, is glorious. And the lower town, because it is a hilltop town, the lower, lower town is where all of, uh, all of your chain stores are, all of your chain restaurants are. And so the top is very well preserved uh, as a center of artisanal uh, experiences. And it's really a joy. I personally happen to really luck out. I did not realize how much Roman remnants were beneath Bergamo until I happened to be in town accidentally in a week when they opened them all for free. All of the cities, all of the cultural sites of the city were open for free. And so not only were they free, but they opened certain archaeological sites that are not generally accessible to the public. They don't have the money and Bergamo isn't enough of a tourist draw. So they don't usually have someone on uh, duty as a guide. However, because I happened to accidentally time my visit, <clears throat> I managed to walk right in and stroll through these incredibly uh, interesting foundations. But again, they're the foundations. They're hidden. If you just wander through the city and look around, you will have a phenomenal medieval experience. Then going from Bergamo, I'm going to hop the other side of Milano to Asti. Asti is mainly known today for its wines. You may uh, be familiar with Asti Spumanti, which uh, the Italian government is rebranding as just Asti because they're trying to turn uh, Italian Prosecco, the Asti variety of Italian Prosecco, into a marketing uh, trademark the way that champagne has become a word, where you don't have to say it's champagne sparkling wine, you just say it's champagne. So rather than saying Asti Spumanti, they're going to say, oh, it's, it's Asti. The interesting uh, problem with that is the fact that there are a lot of other wines in Asti, and there are some amazing reds as well, for example. So if you go to Asti and you have a taste for wine, it has a wealth of opportunities for you. And it is a really pretty medieval city to boot. With the Collegiata di San Secondo, the Cathedral of Santa Maria Assunta, and again, another baptistry, the Baptistry of St. Peter. So I have to say that uh, Asti is glorious. I've only spent a very little time there, but it's been on my to-do list to get back for ages and ages. And uh, I have not been able to make that happen as of yet, which has been unfortunate. And I look forward to eventually managing it once again. So that is the mainland of Italy, bringing us to the islands. Sicily and Sardinia have a massive wealth of history. Sicily in particular has this incredible layering of history where it was uh, Phoenician. Well, first of all, it was Iron Age, Bronze Age, then it was Phoenician, and then it was, Ro it was Phoenician, and then it was Greek, and then it was part Phoenician, part Greek. It might have been Greek and then Phoenician. Anyway, Greeks, Phoenicians, conquered by Rome, uh, conquered by Arabs, conquered by Spain, conquered by Germany, conquered by Normans, conquered by Spain again. Sicily has been handed back and forth for ages, which creates this really interesting uh, culture, as well as this really interesting local styles of architecture. Uh, the food, for example, is phenomenal. My favorite Italian word uh, is built on several loan words because along the western coast of Sicily you find uh, still some uh, traditional Arabic cuisine and so you can eat at a couscouseria because couscous, especially seafood couscous being on the coast, is a very popular dish on the west coast of Sicily even today. In Palermo, you will find Byzantine mosaics, as I mentioned earlier, the like of which you cannot find elsewhere, because by the time the Byzantine Empire said the mosaics have to come down, it was an Islamic city. The Cathedral of Palermo was in comp competition with the cathedral of the neighboring town of Monreale, the Royal Hill, which is the same root words, Royal Mountain, that gives us Montreal in Canada. But the Cathedral of Monreale is no longer seems like it should be a cathedral. The neighboring town of Monreale, which was an equal of Palermo in the high Middle Ages, is now a mere suburb of Palermo. This Monreale has been swallowed by Palermo, except for the fact that it does have this independent medieval heritage. I was in Palermo and I asked to get a bus ticket. I, I went up to buy a bus ticket to Monreale and I thought I'm buying a bus ticket. Uh, you know, normally you, you are getting on a bus, you're going to the neighboring city because everything I'd read, oh, Monreale, Monreale. And I was familiar with the medieval tradition. 
And the guy not only didn't sell me a specific bus ticket, he said he sold me a single round trip ticket. He said, there's nothing in Montreal but the, but the, uh, <laughs> but the cathedral. So take bus number seven or whatever, validate your ticket on the bus. It's good for an hour and a half. And by the time you're done with the cathedral, there is nothing else there and you will still have plenty of time left on your bus ticket. And so it is right there in the dead center of uh, what we would consider the modern city of Palermo, but was in the Middle Ages a separate community. Lots of beautiful things, lots of beautiful things. One of my favorites is uh, Santa Maria de los Spasimo. And uh, the reason I love it is because it's a Gothic church they never quite finished. So they never put a roof on it. It's got trees growing out of the floor. I thought it was a ruin because Palermo had taken some damage in the various wars. But it turns out it was just never done. And so you have this beautiful, incomplete, unfinished Gothic uh, church with uh, this really cool naturalistic element because you also have... Uh, have trees growing out of the center. And as I mentioned, a lot of medieval cities were not big on green space. And so in order to see green space in the medieval setting is really kind of special, at least for the Italian traditions. Taormina. Taormina is very famous among lovers of ancient Greek. Uh, culture because a lot of Greek uh, ruins are still dotting the Sicilian countryside. As I mentioned earlier, there are more surviving Greek temples in Sicily than there are in Greece. And Taormina has this massive, massive theater that has Mount Etna smoking in the background. And it's this stunning location and a very well-preserved theater at that. But outside of the Greek theater of Taormina, it is very much a medieval settlement with these winding, narrow, pretty scenic streets that I highly recommend you explore. The cathedral there is also a particular gem. Now, I'm about to hop to two cities I don't normally talk about in this class because they are much more Greek than they are medieval. However, they do have medieval city cores and the ancient Greek traditions are incredible. And those two cities are Agrigento and Syracuse. So first I'll talk about Syracuse down the coast from Taormina. And Syracuse was an incredibly powerful and important ancient Greek city. Um, a number of important Greek philosophers, including the, oh, it's gonna kill me. Uh, Aristophanes, I believe. Uh, was Syracusan because in ancient Greece you were Greek if you spoke Greek and were culturally Greek. They didn't have the national distinction. So a significant number of people we think of as ancient Greeks were actually ancient Italians and Sicilians like Pythagoras who was uh, at least spent most of his uh, career exiled on the mainland. Uh, Aristophanes, uh, Euripides I believe, uh, the guy with the lever and the, uh, the, the screw hydraulic. Anyway, Syracuse was a big deal. And Syracuse also has an amazingly well-preserved Greek theater. Syracuse, however, has one of those amazing structures that I love. Assisi has another, which is the temple of the gods, the ancient Greek gods, the ancient uh, pre-Christian deities, turned into a church. So the cathedral of Syracuse, like one particular church, as I mentioned in downtown Assisi, is this beautiful uh, Greek structure, I believe dedicated to Athena, with Christian elements uh, adapted with a Christian facade, but you can still very much see the, the structure inside and out is very much an ancient Greek temple. And, uh, and if you're a, a student of Christian history, Syracuse was notably converted when St. Paul himself turned up to preach. They converted the, uh, the main temple of the city into a cathedral in his honor later on. Briefly, I had mentioned Agrigento. Agrigento is also very pretty. Four massive Greek temples in a complex down by the water. If you're in the area, as much as I'm talking up the medieval sites, it really is an unmissable view. If you go to the west coast, not as many people make it out there, but Eriche is on top of the hill outside of Trapani. And Eriche is really cool because it is these layers of history. Again, because Sicily has been conquered by a lot of people. It was a Phoenician stronghold. It was a Roman stronghold. And right now, it is uh, 
populated by several castles, one of which was Saracen, the Pipoli Castle, and uh, the Castle of Venus, which was built by the Normans. And so you have several defensive structures, a winding medieval maze, and a series of couscouseries. So uh, if you do make it out to Erice, which is a bit far off the tourist path, but Erice, in my opinion, is definitely worth a visit if you are a student of the Middle Ages. Taking us to the final destination, Sardinia. I have to say that when I'm talking to Italians and I mention that I've been to all the regions of Italy, the first questions they ask, the first question they ask is, even Sardinia? Yes, I have been to Sardinia. I love Sardinia. Sardinia is adorable. And uh, since I love Genoa, it's very easy comparatively to get to Sardinia from Genoa, either by air or by boat. And so, uh, we're talking about the medieval sites of Italy. I would be remiss if I don't mention Cagliari or Alghero, both of which were really important medieval centers. Cagliari, I believe, being a Pisan fortification when Pisa and Genoa were at war over uh, dominance of the Mediterranean, Tyrrhenian, and Ligurian seas. And then uh, Alghero, I believe, being Genovese which also has a really, really cool 16th century cathedral that is heavily influenced by Catalan Gothic because uh, the other player in Sardinian history in that time period was Spain, and specifically Barcelona. That is the overview. There are, as I said, many details. There are many places I did not get a chance to talk about. And uh, again, any of the places that I mentioned that I list on the handout, please feel free to do a Google image search. You will be happy to have done so. If you are looking to get off the beaten path and for things that aren't generally on the tourism itinerary, I highly recommend the Lonely Planet guidebooks. If you look at a lot of other guidebooks, they will give you the highlights and they're amazing. But if you are planning to go into the nitty gritty, Lonely Planet is really intimidating because they tell you everything. But if you are looking for the things that aren't necessarily on the Tourism Bureau's highlight list, such as the medieval remnants of Italy, Lonely Planet will have information about them. Thank you very much. My name is Vince Conway, Vincenzo de Brescia in the Society. Welcome to <laughs> Penzik 2020. I hope you are staying safe. I hope you are being careful and I hope you're taking care of yourselves. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate you tuning in and joining me today. Have a beautiful, beautiful summer, and I'll see you next time.